Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, my name is Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I have knitting and spinning updates, some new vintage knitting books, and a health and channel update. So let's get started. Last week, I was talking about how I wanted to converge my new love of spinning with sweater knitting, which is one of my favorite things to knit. I think it's been nearly a year since I finished the last sweater I knit for my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. So I, after that project, I just needed a break from sweater knitting for a little while, and now I'm ready to get back into it, but this time, I want to spin the yarn for the sweater and I want to use one of the construction elements I learned from my 1930s sweater, which has an inset yoke. I talked a bit about that last week. If you didn't see that uh, episode, I went a little more in depth into it than what I'll go into today. Uh, so let's go to the overhead and I can show you some of the ideas that I'm playing with. Last week, I was showing you this yarn that I spun up that I, I liked quite a bit. This came, I've, I dug this out of my, my closet. I had a two ounce approximately bat of brown wool that had some pink in it. And the notes from that class I took where I made this bat said there was an ounce and a half of the natural wool and then half an ounce of colored roving. So I really liked this effect and I thought this might be interesting to do to create a yarn similar to this in some way for my first sweater that I knit from hand spun yarn. So I wanted to do some experimenting and I thought, well, I have some natural gray yarn in my, not yarn, um, fleece that I washed. So it's, it's not raw anymore, it's, but it's fleece that would need to be processed in some way before it could be spun. But it's a light gray. And what if I combined light gray with color? Could I get a similar effect that I liked? And so I thought I would use the same proportions that were on the sheet uh, for this class. Uh, one and a half ounces of the main color and then half an ounce of the color. So what I decided to do was to use this. This is some practice sliver um, that I got when I, when I bought my spinning wheel. They gave me a whole pound of this. So this is from Brown Sheep Company. It's wool and mohair. When they make their own yarn, and so when they're switching colors that they're going to do, they end up with a fair amount of this sort of mix of the old color and the new color together. And so it's, it's a nice thing to have like for practice because it's not going to be sold for anything. So I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll run this through, you know, I'll measure out an ounce and a half and I'll run this through my drum carter twice. So I'll create a bat with it and then I'll run that bat through again. And that's going to blend this together to get a gray. And so it wasn't quite fully blended after two runs, but it was going to be the third time when I ran it through that I was going to add the color. So I would take about a fourth of the bat and I would run it through the drum carter and then I would take this a colored roving that I had. So it's this variegated roving and I just sort of applied to this, um, scraped it across the tines of the drum carter so that I was applying it in specific places. And then I'd add another layer of the gray, you know, and then some more of the color. And so what I ended up with was a bat. This is one third of the bat. So I ended up with something that kind of looks like this. So it's a silvery light gray. And then you can see this color. And I was worried that there might be too much color in here because just visually, it seemed like there was more color than was in, um, the bat that I um, used to do this. So what I don't know is if I actually used the entire half ounce of pink when I added it to this bat. I don't know. So um, so I divided this into thirds so I can make a three ply yarn and I spun up some of it and I think I think there just might be too much color or it could be that the light gray is being overwhelmed by the darker colors. I don't know. I'll spin up the other two 
thirds and I'll apply them together and see what happens. So this is the kind of thing that's going to take some experimentation for me to understand like how much to add um, when I'm mixing it. So it's nice to have like these bits that I don't care about um, to do some experimenting with. I told you guys last week also that I had bought this, it's called Wham Wool Alpaca Mohair Blend. Um, roving from at the farmer's market from Teresa at Get Bent's farm and uh, I bought four ounces of it so each of these braid the braids are two ounces I bought four ounces of it I spun it up and I my, my hope was that I had spun the singles fine enough because I was using a, a long draw method a woolen spun method that I was doing the singles fine enough that when I plied them together as a three ply they would fluff up to a worsted weight. So it takes a really fine uh, single with woolen spun, you know, to end, to be able to do three ply like that. I wasn't sure if that was gonna work or not. So this is, th this is the result. I did end up with something that is basically worsted weight. I love the yarn. It's like everything I was hoping it was going to be. And so I had four ounces of it and I thought, what am I going to make with this? And then I thought, I can always get more of this fiber <laughs> because I just had bought it a week before. And so I, I think I plied this and washed it on Saturday and I just loved it. And so on Sunday, I ordered more of it. And then on Monday, I went, I drove to the farm. It's about 45 minutes away. It's in Northfield, Minnesota. And so, the, you know, that's when I got a whole bag full of this. So I have another nine braids of this and I started um, spinning that up um, already. So I think this is what I'm going to use for my sweater. This is a not light enough color gray that this could actually be dyed if I wanted to. So, you know, I, what I have to figure out is, am I going to do a solid color sweater and if I am, what color would I want to dye this? Or do I want to do some kind of color work? And um, just in a little yoke, not a big circular yoke, just an inset yoke. And that only goes to the shoulders. And so I can have satin sleeves. And then would I want this to be the main color? Or would I want this to be part of the contrast for the color work? Last summer, I did an experiment. I had some BFL Blue Face Luster in a solid color. This might have actually had a little bit of silk in it too, but it was BFL, and then this was natural color BFL. And I wanted to do a dyeing experiment. So I made a whole bunch of little mini skeins, and I did, I think, five different colors of dye. And I put a mini skein of this and a mini skein of this into the same jar to see what the colors would be like. Because um, it was a dye that I, I, you know, don't have a lot of experience dyeing. And so it was just my first, first try. So like, here's what happened with the blue. So this was the natural color. And then this was, this was the cream color. And this was the, the gray naturals. And so this is a more interesting color. Um, and then the purple. So, and then you can see like the pink really kind of fluorescent-y and then this is more toned down. So I thought, well, that's a really good thing to know that with, you know, natural colors, you can get some more interesting uh, solid color effects, those more tonal effects. So that is something that I could do um, with this gray is I could dye um, something in a blue or a purple or you know something like that and then I could eat you know I could dye, dye multiple things even and then and then pair that together with the gray and maybe get something uh, kind of interesting I think I'd probably need to go uh, darker um, with these um, more saturated color with these potentially that it'll it would be an experiment to see what would happen so those are some some things I'm thinking about in terms of color and what I could potentially do with this um, so that I don't just have a solid gray sweater I, I mean I love gray I have several gray sweaters I don't really need another gray sweater and I would like to work more on some dyeing skills so that could be um, a nice thing to try. So this is the style of sweater I'm thinking of doing in terms of what I mean by an inset yoke. So it's one where you see that there is body shaping in here, just like if you were doing a regular cardigan and you just had a narrow uh, ribbed band here, you'd, you'd be shaping this. Um, but the way that this was shaped was with short, short rows so that there were live stitches here. Um, the problem was, one of the problems with this was that it, it, it was a circular yoke 
and the front and the back were shaped exactly the same. And you have a problem with this kind of circular yoke, um, just like you do with a regular circular yoke. If you don't have something that, that brings the back of the neck up and the front of the neck down, because your neck does not come straight up out of your shoulders. The back of your neck is kind of in line with your shoulders and then the front of your neck is several inches below. So if you make something that's a perfect circle, it's either going to pull up and back and so the, the bottom of the back is gonna hike up or the front is gonna choke you. It's gonna come up and choke you. It just depends on, on what kind of sweater style it is. So what I did with this sweater was to figure out a way um, to do some short rows at the base of the yoke to kind of um, help bring um, that back up because otherwise the, the back of the, the bottom of the ribbing here would, would end up pulling up. And it's kind of a short sweater to begin with. So that worked okay for this. I mean, this, this part here is longer than this part over here. I couldn't really put the short rows, I didn't feel, within the, this very horizontal pattern because it would be obvious that some of these were wider than others. So, you know, depending on the stitch patterns you're working with, you have to decide how am I going to increase length in here? How am I going to do that? So this has a problem that the regular circular yoke problem can have. And then there's, these are patterns from the 1930s where that this type of inset yoke kind of was popular or, or was used pretty often. Um, and the way these were done um, was, there was some short row shaping, um, but then there was also, because there was the need to, to have more stitches and you'd end up with, with the short rows, you'd pick up stitches in some way. So the purple sweater I knit had a very clever way of adding stitches, additional stitches. It did not require picking them up in the same way that, um, that these did. Uh, and so that, that's kind of interesting. This book here, Poems of Color, which is about that Swedish bohus tradition and the Swedish cottage industry that developed in the 1930s. And at the start, they were doing these kind of inset sweaters. So it's, it's possible they were the ones who came up with this. So instead of having, oh, oh, that ribbed pattern is continuing all the way up here, they have this color work right here and it, and then they they shift it to the main color. This yoke is not going all the way to the shoulders. Um, then you can see, here's, here's some more that are like that. They just go to the shoulders. You can see the, the shoulder seam is uh, right here. And so what they would do with those was they would work them bottom up and then they would do the shaping for the neck opening. They would sew the, the shoulder seams shut and then they would pick up stitches all the way around. So, um, and something like this is pretty wide. Um, it's hard to know exactly, you know, if they had a lot of some live stitches on the needle or exactly how those were done. Um, but this is a style of inset sweater. So this is the kind of thing that I, I think might be kind of interesting to do. But again, I have to figure out, um, you know, how to do the shaping so that the neck ends up lower. And what I, you know, I, I could try to do something where I had live, um, all live stitches or a combination of live stitches and picked up stitches, or I could just do shaping as if, you know, just create an edge and then pick up stitches all the way around. So I have some choices uh, and I, but I need to figure out what sort of stitch pattern I might want to use um, in order to do that. You can see some more of these inset yokes uh, right here. Now it's gonna be a while before I'm ready to cast on for this sweater. I have a lot of yarn to spin and I have some dyeing experiments to do as well as the design work. So in the meantime, I'm really wanting to knit something now, a sweater. I have some Polworth yarn that I bought a few months ago from an Australian sheep farmer who was uh, a guest, our, our monthly guild program speaker via Zoom. Uh, and I just, I bought the yarn, but I didn't have any specific idea for it. So I might have to go look for a pattern published in say the last 20 years in order to figure out um, what I'm gonna do. But actually I'm thinking that that 19, 
sweater that I finished a year ago using an Elizabeth Zimmerman process. It was called the kangaroo pouch sweater. That might work for this because I that was another sweater what I liked a lot of the construction elements and I wanted to, to knit another one. So I you know there were some things I wanted to modify so I could do that. All I would need to do is look up a stitch pattern and then figure out uh, what I wanted to do at different points like the the wrists and the and the bottom hem. Those I'd done as hems before, um, but this time I think I'd probably want to do rib ribbing or something. So so that that could be good because I could get going on that pretty quickly. I just need to pick out some stitch patterns. So stay tuned. That might be coming up soon. I am still working on the second stocking for the 1890s wedding stockings that I've been working on, but there's not really anything to show you right now that would be of interest just yet. The first time I brought all of my yarn and knitting related things into one area of the house because it was spread all over, uh, I felt a little sick to my stomach about how much there was. But my husband said, gee, you really don't have that much yarn. And I was thinking, what are you talking about? Look, look at all of that. But from his perspective, I was knitting a lot and that was just all, all natural accumulation. It wasn't the result of sort of over shopping. Uh, and then he made an observation. He's like, you know, you're not really a collector type. And he's right about that. I'm not a collector type. I don't have a huge yarn stash. I do have leftovers, quite a lot of leftovers. And I tend to use that when I'm trying to figure out ideas. I don't tend to buy yarn until I'm ready for the project, you know, with a few exceptions here and there. But when I first started exploring knitting patterns from the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, most of them were books that were in the public domain that had been digitized and available to download. So I could just look at them on the internet or I could download them and they would stay on my laptop. But eventually I started finding the names of specific titles or specific authors of these vintage or antique books. And some of them were still under copyright, so they're not digitized um, or they just weren't available in a digitized format. So I started to seek out physical copies of those books and I found myself buying a lot of old knitting books. You could see quite a few of them behind me. In early 2020, the start of the pandemic, I was buying so many vintage books that I was a little worried that I was reacting to just being cooped up and stressed out about the global pandemic. But really, it was a function of being immersed in this long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade, from the 1890s to the 1990s. And I realized that what I was actually doing was collecting information. And that was totally in line with the main aspect of my personality, which is that I'm an information seeker. When I get interested in something, I get obsessed and I want to know as much as I can um, as quickly as possible. I just gather, 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 and then I can kind of process it all and kind of work through it and then over time add to that in a, in a little bit slower fashion. But at that point, I was at peak information acquisition. So I did relax a little bit about the book purchasing and it slowed off naturally as I was less um, sort of obsessed about it and I felt like I had enough of a foundation that I could uh, add things more gradually. But during this time when I was collecting these books and I was sharing them on the channel, sometimes viewers would find old knitting books or they would have old knitting books. They might see them at a garage sale or a church sale or just had them in their own archives and didn't want them anymore and they would ask if I would like them and so sometimes it's the t you know it's a type of book uh, or from an era that I'm not that interested in so I would sort of say thanks but no I don't think that's something that I want uh, but often it is something that I'd like to see or have and this past week when I was at our guild's monthly sip and knit one of the people in the guild brought a couple of books that she thought I might be interested in. Our guild uh, has a garage sale every so often, and these were, I think, books that were left over from the last garage sale. And 
our next garage sale is on this Sunday, which is the 13th, August 13th at the textile center. And so she brought them and said, if you don't want them, I'll just take them to the garage sale. It's, it's no big deal. So I looked at them and I did in fact want them. And there are some good reasons why I wanted them. So let's go to the overhead and I'll show you what's inside of these books. Each of them contains some knitting history, but packaged in very different ways. So this is one of those classic little learn to knit booklets that were pretty popular. They might even still be published. I'm sure they are. Um, but it seems like they are something that appeared maybe after World War II. I'd have to look to see when my earliest one was, but it seems like there were quite a few that appeared uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And they're, and it's different from the kinds of knitting books that you would find before that, which might be just full of patterns. And they might be full of patterns, but maybe they'd have a section at the beginning on, on, on the basics. Um, but these little booklets um, seem, to be, seem to have come along later. Um, and this one looks like early 60s based on the drawings in here. There's, there's no copyright date on it and I couldn't find anything on the internet. And then the price, 29 cents, somehow to me seems more of a 60s price. I don't know how I can justify that statement, but that's just what it feels like. So it says all the basic stitches, easy novelty stitches, quick things to make. It's a nice little booklet. It really packs a lot of information in here. They've got a list of the kinds of abbreviations, what they mean, the difference between a row and a ridge. Like for garter stitch, we have ridges that take two rows. Yarns, needles, some fundamentals and tips, you know, how to get started. They've got two methods of casting on. They've got the first one is long tail cast on using the slingshot method. There is a, a method where you can keep the thumb yarn in your left hand and the working yarn in your right hand. I have a video on that. I'll leave that up here and, and down below. And then they've got method number two, which is knitting on. I had to read it to see if it was knitting on or if it was a cable. Um, but it's it's knitting on. And then they explain how to do the knit stitch, uh, what garter stitch is, what pur purling is, stockinette, ribbing, joining yarns at the beginning of a row, which is good advice if you're knitting flat and seaming, uh, which I think might be the assumption for a lot of things. I don't know that I would follow that advice today. Knitting in the round or knitting flat where you where you're not seaming, the edges are exposed. I might not have the tail uh, at, the, at an edge. Different ways to decrease and, and increase. They're showing knit front back is the type of increase and the decreases is knit two together or uh, purl two together and then how to bind off, how to bind off in pattern. Then they have this past slip stitch over, which I would argue, I, I really dislike it when people use that as the name of a decrease. It's ambiguous. It's actually a step of a decrease, any one of several decreases. So I prefer to actually have like, I'll put it on the screen, um, the slip one, knit one, uh, PSSO as the instruction or just SKP. And that produces a left-leaning decrease. It produces the same result as an S SK decrease. But so that's something where I think some people still use that and I, but I think people use that uh, less often. They're talking about finishing off a sock toe and they're calling it weaving. And so this is something I saw a lot in mid-century and earlier is they don't necessarily, they don't call it grafting necessarily. They call it weaving so that you are joining two edges together. How are you weaving them together? So the method they're using is the one that you would Today, a lot of people would call the Kitchener stitch. I prefer just saying grafting. And there are multiple ways of grafting and you can use any of those different methods and get the same result as well. I've got information on blocking and finishing. This is the thing that really made me uh, want this booklet. And that was um, to, do, they're explaining how to do different seams. So a horizontal seam and a vertical seam. And they're calling it to weave lengthwise, a lengthwise seam. And what they're describing is mattress stitch done in a half, so it's a half stitch. So you're using half a stitch from each side. So then the seam itself ends up looking like a, a, a stitch. Most people these days would use a full stitch each time. But back then, like every book from this era and earlier might talk about grabbing a loop from each edge, um, but they would create 
seams that were not necessarily the best looking. They were fairly flat, but but very visible. And this is going to be uh, leaving an, an invisible seam. So this was really interesting. And, and I wish I knew what the year was that this was published so that I could um, keep narrowing things down about when did that first appear in uh, knitting books. Like these five different stitch patterns here. So it's a little stitch dictionary. And then they get into the pattern section. And this first pattern uses these different stitch patterns and then uses in color block. But they've got a lot of different kinds of patterns. They've got some sleeveless uh, sweaters, um, little tops that you could make. This one's knit sideways. Um, these are, you know, kind of chunky knits, so they'd be fast and easy. Um, there's a shawl, there's a poncho. We've got some baby items that look very much like baby items that are still made today. Booties and mitts. Uh, catch a bow, knit him a sweater. Um, so this is stitch pattern is knit one, slip one all the way across on the right side row. And then on the wrong side, you just purl across. So it's a slip stitch pattern. At first I thought it might be a fisherman's rib or brioche, but it's not. It's uh, simpler than that. Got a pair of socks, which is why you need to know how to weave the toe. Uh, and they've got kids a sweater, mittens. So they've got all types of different projects. So it's actually a nice, it, this would have been a nice little book. You could have really learned a lot, but you would have had the same challenges I had when I learned to knit back in the 80s and trying to decipher the instructions by going from one drawing to another and, and figuring out how to make that happen. So it's a nice little booklet and I was very happy to see mattress stitch in here, even if they called it weaving a lengthwise seam. So this is another one where I recognized the cover. It could be that one of my viewers had offered to send me this or told me about it. I don't, I don't know. Or maybe someone sent me a link to it. I, I, but I recognized the cover and I, I don't think I have this book. If I have this book, I never looked through it. And at first I wasn't going to take it because I recognized the dress. I'm like, oh no, I don't think I want it. And she said, oh, but it's because it's about these knitting mills. It's about the history of this particular knitting mill in, I think it was Cleveland, Ohio. This author had was a sculptor and had gone to visit the mill in, I think, 2010, somewhere around there, and, or 2005 maybe. And that you know it was kind of the the mill was kind of on its last legs and there was a lot of antique equipment there some of it was still being used to create things but the the knitting mill business just wasn't like it used to be because you know so much is done overseas these days um, but they had a, a, a like a complete archive of all of the designs that they had ever made and they took this artist through there to look at them and so that's what this book is about. So these patterns go from the 1940s to the 1970s. And so what they've done is they show you the original sweater that's in their collection. And then they have created a, a pattern for hand knitters. So oftentimes it's a very close reproduction. And other times there's a small change made to the design. And other times it's just inspire something else. So you can see here that there's some kind of like vertical pattern going on in, in the sweater, but the pattern that they created has this kind of embroidered argyle design. And I imagine that that is because sometimes the things that you can accomplish in machine knitting isn't practical to do or isn't possible to do in hand knitting. And so they were taking this a basic, the colors and the type of garment. Um, it's got a, a navy blue background, um, back and then a gray front and then this, this pattern. So they were taking that idea and um, modifying it to some extent. And so, you know, they've got the directions and the schematics and all of that in order to make these by hand. This one is a fairly close reproduction of the original. The stitch patterns seem to be very similar, if not identical. This is a case where this original one uh, had, you know, they've taken the, the, in terms of the amount of contrast that was in the original and they've reproduced it in this one. This one was originally a ribbed fabric and this one is done in stockinette. Uh, and then they've got examples of some of the, the sweaters, these poor boy shirts, they call them. Um, different examples from their archive. They take something. Um, like this original one, which had all this kind of brocade 
uh, surface stuff on it and they kind of toned it down a little bit and a lot of times th these aren't this isn't knitting that's applied it's a, some kind of surface technique and so they include tutorials in here that explain how to do that this one is pretty close like this is very close as is this one and again there's a lot of surface stuff going on on this one they talk a little bit about the women who worked in the mills so here's one where it's definitely an inspired thing. So here's the original sweater and instead they turned it into a scarf and hat set instead using again um, surface embroidery to do the designs. Uh, some of the 1960s women's sweaters that are in the archive. It's kind of interesting to see. So this is the one where the project is like very different from the original. Here we've got like a sleeveless sweater with these zigzag patterns and the thing that ended up with that is something with this kind of Greek uh, pattern, different colors. And then they have instructions in here for how to do the lining even. It turned out to be a, a really interesting book. It's out of print, but there's tons of copies of this book all over the place. A books, Amazon, used copies, eBay, various different places for like $5, give or take a couple, depending on where, where you're looking. Um, so it's a nice book if you're interested in sort of that mid-century vintage fashion. Um, this could be an interesting way of getting modern pattern writing um, and getting those vintage looks. Several people have messaged me lately asking about my health and how I'm doing. So I thought I would give you a little bit of an update. For those of you who don't know, last spring I was in the ER a couple of times for heart palpitations. Uh, at the time, there were weeks when I wasn't uploading videos because I was very focused on information seeking, doing research to understand what was going on, both with the electrical issues in my heart, which is why I was in the ER, um, but as well as plumbing issues. So, you know, things like with cholesterol. Um, and the more that I learned, the more unhappy I was with the doctors I had seen in the spring. So earlier this week, I met with a preventive cardiologist that I had been researching since last spring and she turned out to be everything I had hoped she would be. Uh, first of all, she believes in treating the whole patient, not just a symptom, <laughs> and encourages her patients to make all of the types of lifestyle changes that I've made in the past few months, which the previous doctors either didn't bring up or dismissed when I brought them up. We've done some more uh, test results and, re but, and regardless of what comes out of that, I have a doctor who listens and who's focused on the whole me, not just this symptom or that lab test result. So I, I feel great. Uh, I know that I'm healthier than I was back in February and throughout the past six months as I was Focusing on my health, I chose to scale back the number of videos I was uploading during the summer when channel views tend to go way down anyway because people are outside and they're not knitting. I chose to do just one video per week, which was Casual Friday. Finding that I really miss doing the Technique Tuesday videos, but I've also realized that I really prefer the pace of doing just one video per week. So starting in September, I'm going to alternate between doing technique videos and casual Friday videos, just doing one video per week. Um, there may be times when I put out technique videos more often than casual Friday videos or vice versa, um, but that's my plan for now. Uh, so my question for you guys is, would you prefer the videos always to come out on the same day of the week with a clear label in like the title or the thumbnail that indicates whether it's a technique or a podcast video. Cause I know some people watch everything and some people prefer only one or the other. Or would you prefer that I, that the technique videos stay on Tuesdays and the podcast videos stay on Friday. So you'd have a Tuesday one week, a Friday the next week, then Tuesday the week after that alternating like that. Which would you guys prefer? You can let me know down in the comments. Obviously, I'd have to change, you know, how I label these videos. If they were all on the same day, it would just be technique or podcast or something like that. Um, otherwise, I can keep the names. If I keep them on separate days, I can keep it as technique Tuesday, casual Friday. Something to think about. So let me know down in the comments if it matters to you at all, if you have any thoughts. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about 
today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.